Welcome to Christ Community Church. Pastored by Dr. Carly King Sr. and Dr. Jean Porter King, where we are the community within a community of faith. Please turn your attention to the word provided by Dr. King. Amen, amen. We're coming out of the book of Acts, the fourth chapter, and we're not going to be before you long. Give me about 20 minutes or so. And um, if there was ever a time for the church to be pictured as a strong place, a, a place of refuge, a strong place of refuge, it's now. We don't need pictures of a weak church because it's got weak members. Somebody ought to have said amen. Well, let, let me, I'm talking to the wrong group. Let me talk, let me, let me see who my audience is on today. We don't need to be a weak church. And the only way we cannot be a weak church is we've got to have some power. We've got to have some anointing. We've got to be filled with the Holy Ghost, amen? Amen, amen, because whether you know it or not, or knew it or not, the devil is not taking hostages. And so a declaration is a formal or explicit statement or announcement. It's a formal or explicit statement or announcement. And we will talk about the kinds of statements or announcements we need to make as we go on in the text. But I'm going to ask you to read with me. We'll be in the fourth chapter starting at verse 23. And you can follow along. Everyone, if you could just stand, I'll do the reading. You can just follow along as we read the Word of God. In Acts 4, 30, uh, starting with verse 23, it says, And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So when they had heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things and the kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ? For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to, do, to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus has risen from the dead and ascended in power to the Father. The Holy Spirit has fallen, and we know that there were during this dispensation of the Holy Spirit, there were 120 in that upper room and the Spirit of God came upon them. The church begins to experience exploding growth. After Peter preaches his sermon of all the people who are preaching and miracles are being manifested starting with this lame man being healed. He was lame from birth and healed and he was so excited that he runs and tells everybody what has happened. Peter and John, in giving an explanation of this power of God, the miraculous working power of God, were taken, they were arrested and taken before the Sanhedrin and given another opportunity to share uh, the story of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's interesting uh, that the elders or the powers that be, they could not 
They could not stop Jesus. They could not stop the message of Jesus. They tried to kill him. And he rose from the dead. And then to try to uh, cloud the issue about his raising from the dead, they paid individuals to lie and spread a rumor that uh, someone stole his body. His disciples stole his body. They were kept trying to thwart the, the message, the, the, the gospel, this good news. And so here, they now have Peter and John that were before them, and uh, they were continuing, Peter and John continuing to speak and teach in the name and heal in the name of Jesus. And so after being released, the elders could not figure out a way to punish them, so they threatened them. Now, isn't this something? It's just like the devil. To do all he can to try to stop you from going forth and sharing your testimony and knowing all the time that he can't do it, but he'll still try. I want to encourage you, church, don't stop, don't bow, don't bend, don't back up. When God has given you a work or he has given you a word, then go forth. Tell your neighbor, go forth. Go forth. Go forth. When God has given you a testimony, it wasn't just that God had given them uh, a word. God had shown them, had, uh, they had seen and heard uh, the power. They'd seen the power of God and, and heard about it. They were witnesses of the power of God. And let me tell you this, and you need to tell your neighbor that uh, we need each other's testimony. I'm going to say that again. I need your testimony and you need mine because the enemy would have us to think that we're going through some stuff and we're going through all by ourselves and he'll have you to be in a, your own little pity party and, uh, and you'll even invite folk to your party and tell them how bad things are with you and how life isn't working out just like you thought or how the relationship isn't working. But listen, I want you to know that everybody's got trouble. Everybody's got their situation. Everybody has got their story. But listen, but it's something when the Spirit of the Lord and the power of the Lord, the, the anointing of God comes into your story, divine intervention, and he turns the thing upside down, right side up. Lord, come on, give it the Lord a praise. Did God, has he done anything for anybody? Can you remember when you were going through and you heard somebody else was going through and you got faith and confidence from their story? The enemy would have you to be quiet. But you know God's been good to you. You know God is a deliverer. You read about it, but you know it for yourself. You know he's a healer. You know he's a way maker. You know he's a bridge. Come on, he's a bridge over troubled water. You know he'll make a way out of no way. You kn we know it. Nobody has to tell me. I read it, but I tried it for myself. And I know that God is good, and he's good all the time. And even when I can't appreciate, I can't see, I can't understand, he's still working things for our good. Come on. So you've got to give your testimony of healing, of protection, hallelujah, of the wondrous working power. It's a wondrous working power. It's a working power. And it keeps on working day in, day out, hallelujah. Power of Jesus. And sometimes, sometimes we can be so frustrated with things, sometimes Listen, church, sometimes I want you all to get in the habit of just learning to call on his name. You might not even have time for a long prayer, but just calling Jesus. Can I hear you all do that? Just say, Jesus. I'm going to tell you, just hearing his name is reviving me. Hallelujah. Giving me some. Can you say his name is what? Jesus. Because there is power in the name of Jesus. See, see, when the devil starts coming in, or, or he, maybe the devil's not there, but he sent his imps, his, his little uh, demons out, and they're, they're, they're coming on you, and then all of a sudden, you just say, Jesus. They, they start looking around. They tremble at the name of... 
And see, what happens is too often we allow the presence of evil to stay around because we don't call on the name of You might, get, listen, maybe something is coming to your mind right now where you needed to call on the name of You know that you've got to face something when you leave here, but you know that, listen, you don't face it alone because he said he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Call on his name. His name is what? Jesus. Jesus. Jeez, hallelujah. You all have heard me tell the story. I like telling the story, uh, even though you might have heard, but for those who haven't heard, I was a student at Purdue, uh, and we had left Purdue 120-some miles to come into Chicago to a, a revival. It was in the dead of winter. Uh, the students and I, we, it seemed like any time we knew that there was going to be an evangelist somewhere, uh, we would go. And so we, we heard about this evangelist, and so a bunch of us, about five of us, got into a, a Chevy, and we drove to the revival. And while we were there, at the end of the revival, the evangelist said, I sense the presence of death. I said, he says, but we're going to bind that spirit in the name of Jesus. And so we prayed, all of us prayed. We didn't understand, we didn't know, but we prayed. At the end of service, we all hop into that car. We're headed back 100 and something, maybe 200 miles to Purdue. It's late at night. It's snowing. It's ice. And we hit some black ice. And uh, I was a young driver. And you know how young drivers are. They always know you can't tell them anything. And they speed. Young people, I love you though, I will tell you. But, but it, it helps when we listen. But nevertheless, uh, there was a, a gentleman, uh, he was an older gentleman, and he said, uh, Brother King, he said, uh, you're going a little bit too fast for the conditions. You need to slow down. Matter of fact, uh, check your, pump your brakes, pump your brakes. Now, by this time, we were next to a 40-footer truck. And he says, pump your brakes. Now, he's sitting on the... Uh, passenger side so he's right next to the brother King slow down pump your brakes I jammed on the brake and I hit that black ice or I was on the black ice so we began to hydroplane you know what I'm talking about I lost control of the car we we're next to the truck and my car is swerving and I've really lost control of it I don't know what I'm doing and the car is going underneath the truck at this time, right in front of the back tires, right in the middle. And I, I turn around, and I, I was thinking about this today, and I said, so this is how I'm going to die. I had given up. I thought we were going to be killed. Debbie, her name was uh, uh, French at the time. It's Keys now. But Debbie was sitting in the passengers, in the back passenger seat, and she saw those tires. She saw we were going underneath the truck. And she just said, Jesus. The, the, the tires of the truck hit the car. But when it hit the car, we were still on black ice. And the car just slid over to the side of the road. And we stopped. There's power in the name of I'm still here because of Jesus. Ah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm still here. You're still here because of Jesus. And when you didn't know he was watching over you, when you didn't appreciate that he was protecting you, he was doing it. And that's why we thank God for his grace and his mercy. Come on, give the Lord a praise. But we are a threat to the enemy. We are a threat to demons and to the devil. Uh, in that fourth chapter of the book of Acts, in verse 13, it says that they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained and they marveled. So here we are a marvel. We're a marvel. We're uh, we're peculiar, we're particular, we're special, we're something to look at. And so when people 
are looking at your life. They marvel at how you got over a situation or how you're so calm in the midst of a situation or how you believe in the midst of oncoming danger, but you believe that you've, you've got a way out and you, they're wondering how, how do you do? They marvel. They marvel. But I'm going to tell you, it's marvelous what the Lord does. Somebody give the Lord a praise. But the evidence, the evidence, you know, they, they, when we tell our story, it, they, they, they can't argue with us. They might want to, but the evidence is compelling. It's compelling. In verse 14, they, seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. When some folk would try to discount your faith, but there's too much, say too much evidence. God has been doing too much for too long all around you. And whatever you've got, you can say it's been nothing but the grace of Jesus. It's been nothing but the goodness of God. It's been nothing but the grace of the Lord. Somebody give the Lord a praise. So the evidence is compelling. They couldn't argue that in verse 14 that they see this lame man from birth. Everybody knew his story. They had been maybe accosted by him and being asked for alms or asked for money. He was begging by that temple door, temple gate, and maybe they had seen him a number of times. And now they see him running and leaping and shouting. But not only is, are we a marvel and not only is the evidence compelling, but our presence becomes a source of confusion. Verse 16, what shall we do with these men? You know, some, and, and, and let me just, why is it confusing? Because our message is formidable and it's a threat. It's a threat to the powers that be. Let me just for just a second just remind us, everybody is not excited about goodness. Let me say it again. Everybody does not have our best interest in mind. Let me just share the put like this. Evil exists and so do evil people. And so everybody is not happy that every, other folk get jobs. Everybody is not happy that you get a raise. Some folk don't care if you have insurance or if you can afford insurance. Some folk don't care if you get shot up. Some evil exists so our presence in the midst of evil see the Lord tells us that we're to love our enemies so we confuse our enemies when we uh, treat them right when they have diabolically set things up to mess you up but you say listen you're not my source I don't have to worry but I'm gonna love God tells me to love on you in spite of you so I'm gonna love you with the love of God in spite of how you're treating me because my source is the Lord he is my strength he's my provider he's my way man. he's my everything so go ahead you can be whatever you want to be but I'm gonna be obedient to the Lord Hallelujah. Has any of, us, has any of us ever loved unlovely people? Yes. And so because our presence is a source of confusion, verse 16, what should we do with these men? And because our message is formidable and it's a threat, so in verse 17 they said, let's make sure this doesn't spread any further. And so they thought that by the time you're in verse 21 that uh, we'll just threaten them. So since we are threatening, we will get threats. Ah, and we, we, we get them even, sometimes we don't understand. We see things that happen in the natural and sometimes we want to stay in the natural, but we've got to also keep our spiritual eye on and recognize that the enemy is busy. And so there's many things that materialize in the physical realm that we, we've got to get the victory in the spiritual realm. That's why spending time with God in prayer and devotion is essential. Somebody give the Lord a praise. Because when we get on a spiritual, the devil's spiritual radar, we, we, we got a battle ahead of us. But, but, but here, uh, the, the, the world, we're in a, uh, an environment in which God is challenging us to live counterculture, 
to the rest of the world, counterculture. We, we, are, we are a peculiar people. We are a different group of folk. What do I mean? Well, in 1 Peter 5 and 6, it tells you to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he will exalt you in due season. So we are to exhibit humility in a world that is proud and boastful. We are to put our confidence in God and the world puts their confidence in themselves. Mark 11 and 22 tells us, have faith in God. In Acts 20, verse 35, it tells us that we are to be givers. Matter of fact, the Bible says it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. The world is full of takers. So we are counterculture. We are to, we're admonished to sacrifice even when it means the sacrifice of our lives for one another, but the world protects itself. In Luke 17, 33, it says, whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. In John 15, verses 18 through 19, it tells us we're not of the world. In Romans 12 and 2, it tells us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind and not conform to the world. In Matthew 5 and 11, or and also 1 Peter, 3, uh, 1 Peter 4, verses 12 through 19, we are to rejoice when we are insulted for Christ's sake. Well, the world tells us to be upset. In Matthew 5 and 13, the Bible lets us know we are the salt of the earth. In Matthew 5, 14, we are the light of the world. We're counterculture in this really post-Christian environment. Now, as I'm looking at this story, these two individuals could have said that life is tough enough. I just don't need any more headaches. It was rough enough following Jesus before the ascension. Here these elders, these Sanhedrins are saying, we better stop preaching, so let's throw in the towel. And, 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 and sometimes it's almost as if the church has thrown in a towel. You know, you know that uh, the, the example I'm giving, it's almost like in a, in a fight and two men or, or, or two individuals in a ring fighting and the towel is thrown in when you know that your person is getting the daylight seemingly whipped out of them. And so to avoid any further damage, the coach throws in the, well, Listen, our coach has not thrown in the towel. Come on. And the fight is still on. Tell your neighbor the fight is still on. And what happens is what I sometimes see is not that the church is thrown in the towel. Maybe the church sometimes says, I wish the towel was thrown in, but the Lord is saying, no, the battle is still going on. And so, the, and the bell has rung, so get out of that corner get off that stool and get out there and tell your neighbor fight fight tell your neighbor on the other side it's time to fight see I, I I say it from time to time and I'll have a habit of repeating myself but listen I'm tired of the shooting that's going on I, I don't like the fact that when I'm driving into Chicago I'm wondering if I need to put on a bulletproof vest I don't I, I don't like the thought when I'm going through Chicago that there's certain areas that I just rather I wouldn't be in I don't like that I've got to always be patting myself down and looking over my back I don't like that and I don't like it that when I'm looking at my children and I'm thinking about their future somebody has to keep adding into Social Security Let me, let me put that again. Let's, let's see, see, baby boomers, we live in longer, okay? And we need somebody to be, keep on paying into Social Security because somebody hadn't been treating Social Security right in the first place. But it makes me a little leery when I'm thinking about the, the potential salaries that my young people are going to have. They might not even make the same kind of dollars that we're making right now. And they might be relegated to living in our house. Tell your neighbor the fight is on. 
We're in the midst of a battle. And you look here, there's no other institution that can talk about what we're talking about and have their, the power and the ability to do something about it like the church. Somebody say the church. The church. There's power in the church. Why? Because even God said when he talked about, Jesus talked about uh, the house, it should be the house of what? Prayer. And uh, prayer makes a difference. Prayer changes things. Prayer is inviting divine intervention. So it doesn't matter how bad the situation is. When I'm in the, the house of prayer and I'm with one another and I'm in, invoking the spirit of God and the anointing of God and the presence of God and the power of God, then prayer changes things. It doesn't matter how dark the situation situation looks prayer changes it doesn't matter who's in office prayer changes it doesn't matter what they try to legislate prayer changes things it doesn't matter what's going on in my community prayer somebody give the Lord our praise hallelujah glory and look at here don't write off the church yeah, there's some doom and gloom, and I've even quoted some stats that we're only two generations away from the church being obsolete. Because if you look at my millennials, there's really not a whole lot of credence or respect that they want to give the church. Because it's like, what has the church been doing? Well, I'm telling the church, get off that stool. Get out of the corner and get in the fight. Somebody tell your neighbor, get in the fight. Get in the fight. Yeah, all of us are going to have some stuff that goes on. Hallelujah. All of us are going to have some threats that go on in our life. Yes, Peter and John had some threats. Told them, listen, you, we're going to let you go, but just be quiet. And don't be mentioning that name. But, but this is the thing. How do, we, how do we get off the stool? How do we, I'm about finished. How do we get in the fight? My wife sometimes accuses me of being a little scrapper. Yeah, I am a bit of a scrapper, I think. Hallelujah. But let me help you all be scrappers too, amen? Hallelujah. Scrappers in Jesus' name. And so what, what happens, there's a... The, one, he's a uh, uh, apologetist and a theologian. He's a pastor. His name is Timothy Keller. And, and, and this is why you want to get in the fight. I like how he describes, because when we, we get in the fight, what are we doing? What were the, the priest and the Sanhedrin really forbidding or threatening Peter and John not to do? They were threatening them on telling truth or not just even truth telling good news what were Peter and John doing they were just sharing the gospel they were talking about the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Christ and at its basic level Tim Keller says at its basic level the gospel is about healing relationships it's about relationships our first our relationship being healed with God and watch this, and because my relationship is healed with God through Jesus Christ, then that gives hope to any and every other relationship. If my relationship can be repaired with God, then what other relationship is greater than that? None. And so there's hope, it doesn't matter how bad the relationships are, that there's hope that Marriages can be healed. Husbands and wives have hope. I know you might want to say, listen, I, and I, I got to be careful, but uh, that, I'll put it like this. That, that brother, uh, he has just got on my nerve. That's it. No, I know that sometimes brothers don't get it. I know that sometimes sisters don't get it. I know that there's conflict. But listen here, there's still hope. There's still good news that there can be a repair in the breach. I know that families can be healed. Children, I want to encourage you, young people, listen. Don't stop praying for your parents. Come on. It's easy to just be mad at them. 
because they're messing up your life and your stability as you know it. It's like, how, oh, I don't clap, I don't, because I don't want anybody to know who, who you are. All right. I understand, all right? But look at here. But pray, t tell one another, we, I got to pray for my parents. Now, y'all can say the same thing. We got to pray for, we need prayer. <laughs> we need prayer. Families can be healed. Communities can be delivered through prayer. Amen? So we're not going to give up on God because he hasn't given up at all. So let me just talk about it in these fast, these fleeting moments. Um, their strategy, Peter and John, uh, and, and if you will, it was just God using them, but it, it is a strategy here, and this strategy, I believe, is a strategy we can use. Uh, you all try to keep up with me uh, on the PowerPoint. I think my PowerPoint just went dead, but nevertheless, their strategy. One, in verse 23a, the first part of that, when they were released from the Sanhedrin, notice what they do. And being let go, they went to their, what? Own companions. And so who do you go to when you've just gotten some bad news? Who do you go to when uh, you've been threatened, when your existence has been threatened, when your future has been threatened? Here you were on a high one minute and then uh, life looked good and looked great and folk were being helped and delivered and healed and you know that you've been doing right but all, and you've been just trying to do right but all of a sudden now you've got bad news. Who do you go to when you get threatening news? Now this is what, it didn't say they went to their family, it didn't say that, it said they went to their own companions those who had prayed with them those who were praying for them in essence they went back to the church that had become now their family that had been become now their their company of of gathering and so it was in the church that was their new existence and so I want to encourage you just don't go to anybody you need to go to somebody who's loving Jesus like you're loving Jesus and and has a, a, a heart for the things of God and a heart for the will of God and can watch this can get a prayer through you don't need to just be around just anybody but you need to be with somebody that knows how to get on their knees maybe even not even ask a whole lot of questions but because they didn't in the text is not showing they had a whole lot of conversation one with another the disciples came back and they get with their own company they report all so you need maybe a group that will listen don't have a whole lot to say to you let them talk to God somebody give the Lord a praise went to their own companions and then not only uh, did they go to their own companions but then when they got there they shared the challenge it says, and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So they had a time to debrief. They had a time to share. Who can you be transparent with? Who can you be vulnerable with? We were talking about this on yesterday at the men's ministry on what it means to have real friends. Who uh, will be uh, uh, non-condemning and, and non-judgmental but will just listen? They went to their companions. They shared their challenge and then their companions had a prayer meeting hallelujah ah prayer works what did we say prayer what it says verse 24 so when they heard that they raised their voice to one another does it say that it says they raised their voice to to god they didn't have a, a talk and listen, we're going to have a strategy meeting and listen, we're going to go back to the temple and listen, you take the one a gate, you take the other gate, you take the other gate. We're going to get with the lame man and we're going to just, no, they didn't do all that. No, no, they, the Bible says they raised their voice together. They raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God. Listen, God, uh, 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 we're not even, we don't even know necessarily what to do, but God, you're God. We recognize that you're Jehovah. You're the Lord of Lords. You made the, hallelujah, heaven and earth and the sea. Now listen, 
Uh, sometimes when we're praying, listen, we're not reminding God of who he is, but sometimes we need to remind ourselves that we're serving a great big God. And the God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them is the same God that I want to talk to because he could take care of my little problem. Who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things and the kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. So they had a prayer meeting. But not only did they have a prayer meeting, here they were specific in their prayer requests. By the time we get to verse 29, now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. I told you it's time to fight. Say it's time to fight. Here they ask for boldness that they may speak his word. They were specific in their prayer, specific in what they were asking. It, it wasn't boldness so that they could uh, uh, have be in a better light. It was boldness so they could continue to do the work of the Lord. Listen, it's something about God. If we focus on extending his kingdom and doing his work, he'll take care of ours. He'll take care of whatever we think is important to us. But in verse 29, now, Lord, look on their threats and, their, and grant your servants that with all boldness that they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Sometimes, we're closing out, sometimes the reason why we go through some of the things that we go through is to put us in a position where we can be in conversation with the Lord. Too often, for some of us, too often, uh, we are preoccupied with taking care of our own story. And so what the Lord will many times do is allow things to come to, to help us to get a better sense of clarity on what we're supposed to be doing or how we're to live out our life. Our life, listen, it is an insult to God to create a, an agenda and then say, God, you bless it. God, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and all I need, God, is you, is you periodically, when I'm feeling a little weak, to show up. God says, well, what does that, someone said, Elder Reed, I think, yesterday, are we building a resume or a eulogy? Meaning, uh, when it's all said and done, are we going to try to give God our credentials God, I went to this school, and God, I went to this school, and God, I had this job, and God, I, was a, I had this title, and I had this title. Or are we going to give a eulogy where, God, I did this in your name. I did this for your glory. I did this for the kingdom. I was about your work, your will being done on earth. And so when, when they focused on stretching out their hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. I said sometimes God allows us to go through things because he wants to get, get our attention. But it's not all just to get our attention. God wants to also change our intentions. So he wants our attention that he can look at our intentions and say I want to give you my will. My will is that everybody, I want people to be healed. I want people to be delivered. I want people to be in right relationship with me. And so now that I've got your attention, now that you're asking for my help, let me tell you what I want from you. There was a point number five, a visible sign of the presence of God in verse 31. And when they prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. So God is letting them know. It reminds me of when the Holy Spirit first comes in that second chapter and these cloven tongues of fire, there's this wind, like a rushing mighty wind. And so these signs and wonders of the presence of God, letting them know that God is responding to them. So there's this visible sign. And then it says, 
they were assembled together with was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit so there was this external visible sign and then there was this internal manifestation afresh these are men and women who had at one time in the second chapter received the Holy Spirit and now it's a, a fresh anointing and then finally and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Parhasia is the Greek. It means to be outspoken, unreserved utterance, freedom of speech, candor, cheerful courage, opposite of timidity or fear. Outspoken. God, they spoke the word of God with boldness. God is wanting us to give, I believe, holy or bold declarations. Bold declarations. I'm really finished, but let me just share with you. Uh, the Bible lets us know in Proverbs 28 and 1, the wicked flee without when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. The righteous are bold as a lion. We're in the last day and I believe that the Spirit of the Lord wants to come upon us. The Bible says in Joel 2, 28, that there would be an experience or an encounter. He says that I will pour out my, flesh, my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth. Hmm. He goes on to say that the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day. And it shall come to pass, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I believe bold declarations, uh, this cheerful courage, this freedom of speech, this candor as we're sharing boldly before individuals the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Whosoever believeth shall not perish. I'm challenging the church to open our mouths and begin to boldly declare the love of God and the peace of God, that the Spirit of God wants to come in and to right relationships, to turn things around. And so our de declaration or our prayer, Lord, help us to make bold declarations. Lord, we pray for boldness. Lord, we pray for your anointing. Lord, we pray for your spirit. Lord, we're going to pray until something happens. And Lord, we're not going to be counted guilty for sitting on you. He's done, the songwriter got it right. He's done so much for me, I cannot tell it all. So God, because you've done so much, I'm not going to sit on you. Because you've done so much, I'm going to be a part of bold declarations. I'm not going to be silent on you. Because you've done so much, I'm not going to quit on you. It's time to declare boldly, he's done so much for me. One thing I can say, he's taken all of my sins away. I sense the Lord is saying, stand up, speak up, and let the Holy Ghost use you. Let the Holy Ghost have his way. Everybody standing. We've got to make some bold declarations. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to pray because the fight is on. If the church doesn't share this good news, who will? I don't care what they're doing in the White House. We've got a bold declaration. God wants to turn things around. I don't care how bad it is in Springfield. Bold declarations. God wants to heal relationships. City Hall, Village in South Holland, our international communities. God wants to do a new thing. I believe that these are the last days and he's saying, listen, get ready. Get ready. If there's a one that and I'm going to come down. If there's a one that does not know Jesus as their Savior, you do not have an assurance that heaven is your home. You're not in right relationship with God. 
then we want to pray with you and lead you to the feet of Jesus. Is there one? I'm coming down. Thank you for joining our broadcast today. For additional information, please visit us on our website, our Facebook page, or Twitter.